very warm welcome to you to St Helens Church, Wheat Hampstead, to our online service for Monday Thursday. Ash Wednesday seems like an awfully long time ago, uh, and whatever it was that you were planning to give up for Lent, I think that this year all of us have given up much more than we ever expected to. Jesus told his disciples that if they wanted to become his followers, they must deny themselves, take up their cross and follow him. For those who wanted to save their lives would lose them, but those who were prepared to lose their lives for his sake would find true life. Our prayer this Holy Week and Easter is that in our following of Jesus, in his journey through death to resurrection, we would find that true and new life. Now on Monday Thursday we'd normally gather in church to celebrate the Holy Communion of the Last Supper uh, but this year we're not able to do that so instead we're having a prayer service of vigil following Jesus' commands to watch and pray. The service is based on the events of Monday Thursday as recorded in the biblical stations of the cross and it follows a pattern of reading and reflection, some of which are written by the theologian Paula Gooder and read by our own readers, and then a short prayer and a response. Uh, the response will appear on screen for you to join in with. Uh, and then each of these sections is followed by music and then a period of silence. The silence lasts for a few minutes. Uh, so you might like to have a Bible handy if that would help you to uh, pray into that period of silence. Let's begin with prayer. Almighty and everlasting God, who in your tender love towards the human race sent your Son, our Saviour Jesus Christ, to take upon him our flesh and to suffer death upon the cross, grant that we may follow the example of his patience and humility and also be made partakers of his resurrection through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Holy God, holy and strong, holy and immortal, have mercy upon us. Quen <laughs> 
Jesus washes his disciples' feet. We adore you, O Christ, and we bless you, because by your holy cross you have redeemed the world. A reading from the Gospel according to John. When Jesus had finished washing the disciples' feet, he put on his clothes and returned to his place. Do you understand what I have done for you? He asked them. You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. Very truly I tell you, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. In this Holy Week 2020, we're faced with the need to do things differently. And our Maundy Thursday remembrance is no exception. Without physically gathering around the communion table, we have to take the opportunity to meet through the wonders of technology. The message, however, is unchanged. The symbolic gesture of Jesus washing the disciples' feet in service to one another is probably more relevant than ever. A few years ago, I gave an address to the Maundy Thursday evening service at St Helens, in which I suggested, for example, that doing the shopping at Tesco for a neighbour is a way of giving service to others. Ironically, this year, for me, that is turned upside down. As Jill and I, together with so many others, by dint of age and vulnerability, have to isolate ourselves and rely on our supermarket suppliers being met by neighbours and friends serving us, some of whom are also delivering care, aid and comfort through their work in the NHS or other frontline activity. We, like so many others, are so grateful as they fulfil the command to love your neighbour as yourself. There is, however, a certain feeling of guilt as we sit back and receive the gifts of kindness without reciprocating practically. However, we hope that the gift of prayer will be some compensation. 1 Timothy chapter 4 verse 4 reminds us everything created by God is good and nothing is to be rejected if it is received with thanksgiving. Our journey this Holy Week is supported by the love of all those I have mentioned to help us through the dark days ahead as we travel the way of cross to Good Friday. Things seem to be getting worse day by day. A direct parallel may be to the current situation globally. However, we know where Holy Week ends on Easter Sunday, with new life at the resurrection. Likewise, there will be a day of resurrection to normal and new life as the current trials and fears are conquered by our faith and our service following Jesus' teaching. Then let us consider for a moment some of the implications for us to be a servant of Jesus Christ. Faithfulness is probably the first requirement of a servant of Christ. Servants of Christ are entrusted with God's truth and are concerned with the well-being of God's household. Peacefulness is another requirement of the servant of Christ. Happy are the peacemakers, is Jesus' word to his disciples. And if his servants were paused to think 
where there is tension and conflict, and then go there to offer our apologies or comfort and help, and they will begin to know what happiness is. Adaptability is a further requirement of the servant of Christ. This is an important point in the example that Jesus set when he washed the feet even of the man who was about to betray him. Adaptability towards people requires a genuine humility of heart. And many are incapable of it and cannot adapt themselves because they cannot unbend a little, let alone to the point where they can humble themselves before others. Spirituality is probably the key implication of being a servant of Christ, being filled with the Spirit. Spirituality is a word that is relevant to every servant of the Lord. Jesus reminds all his followers, all his servants, without me you can do nothing. He reassured his servants with the familiar words, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. It is this spiritual requirement of the servant that is actually primary and governs all things. So that as servants filled with the Spirit of Christ, we can then become faithful, peaceful, adaptable in following the pattern set by Jesus Christ who he himself was the servant of God. Maybe we're seeing signs of a new pattern of life which may emerge following those principles throughout our community and the world as we emerge from the darkness of the plague which surrounds us. As we recognise the agony which God shares at the death of his son, and the hope of joy, which blossomed with new life on Easter Day. Amen. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, you were obedient to the end and drank the cup prepared for you. May we who share your table watch with you through the night of suffering and be faithful. To you, Jesus, who washed your disciples' feet, be honour and glory with the Father and the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Holy God, holy and strong, holy and immortal, have mercy upon us. An upper room did our Lord prepare for those he loved until the end, and his disciples to gather there to celebrate their risen friend. A lasting gift Jesus gave his all to share his bread, his loving cup, whatever burdens may burst up, he by his cross shall lift us up. And after supper he washed their feet, for service to his sacrament, in him our joy shall be made complete. Sent out to serve as he was sent. No end there is, we depart in peace. He loves beyond the outermost. In every room in our Father's house, he will be there as Lord and host.
Jesus in agony in the Garden of Gethsemane. We adore you, O Christ, and we bless you, because by your holy cross you have redeemed the world. A reading from the Gospel according to Mark. They went to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to his disciples, Sit here while I pray. He took with him Peter and James and John and began to be distressed and agitated. And he said to them, I am deeply grieved, even to death. Remain here and keep awake. And going a little further, he threw himself on the ground and prayed that, if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. He said, Abba, Father, for you all things are possible. Remove this cup from me, yet yeah, not what I want, but what you want. Jesus in agony in the garden of Gethsemane. Remove this cup from me. It is tempting to imagine that life was easy for Jesus, that so sure was he about who he was and who he was called to be, that he faced suffering and death with calm and equanimity. It is certainly the case that at other points in the Gospels, Jesus appears to face what lies ahead of, for him with profound composure. So much so that he even prophesies about his own death on numerous occasions. Any thoughts in this vein that we might have, however, about Jesus' emotions about his own death are put firmly in their place by Jesus' prayer at Gethsemane. The words used to describe how he feels communicate an overwhelming sense of anguish, distress and grief. Indeed, against the backdrop of Jesus' composure elsewhere, his distress and agitation, which the passage implies is both physical and verbal, must have been horrifying to behold. Even more than that, the passage makes clear that Jesus would do anything at this point to avoid what lies ahead. It is often said that bravery is not found in people who fear nothing and feel no fear, but in those who face their fears head on and do it anyway. Here, Jesus models for us what true bravery looks like. He knows exactly how terrible the next few days will be for him, and he is profoundly distressed at the prospect. Nevertheless, he agrees to face them anyway. Brave is not normally a characteristic we associate with Jesus. But this passage makes it clear that brave is exactly what he was. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, you entered the garden of fear and faced the agony of your impending death. Be with those who share that agony and face death unwillingly this day. You shared our fear and knew the weakness of our humanity. Give strength and hope to the dispirited and despairing. To you, Jesus, who sweated blood, be honour and glory with the Father and the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Holy God, holy and strong, holy and immortal, have mercy on us.
Jesus betrayed by Judas and arrested. We adore you, O Christ, and we bless you because by your holy cross you have redeemed the world. A reading from the Gospel according to Mark. Immediately, while he was still speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, arrived, and with him was a crowd with swords and clubs from the chief priests, the scribes and the elders. Now the betrayer had given them a sign saying, the one I will kiss is the man. Arrest him and lead him away under guard. And so when he came, he went up to him at once and said, Rabbi, and kissed him. Then they lay hands on him and arrested him. Jesus betrayed by Judas and arrested. The betrayer. The title betrayer is damning. It implies someone who callously deceives another, bringing about their downfall. It's a word that, for nearly 2,000 years, has been associated with Judas. Despite Christian history's near universal condemnation of Judas, the Gospels are more varied in their treatment. John's Gospel is the most damning. There Judas is attributed with double motivation, that he stole from the common purse and that the devil had put it into his heart. Luke is mildly forgiving. He didn't attribute any motivation to Judas, but did record that Judas had bought a field with a reward of his wickedness and fell over in it and died. Matthew and Mark, however, are different. Matthew records Judas's remorse an attempt to return the money given to him before going out to hang himself, whereas Mark appears neutral. It's indeed the case that the English translation calls him the betrayer, but the Greek word used in Mark, and indeed in all the Gospels, means simply hand over. Whilst it's clear John used the word to mean betray, in Mark, this is less clear. The word, paradidomi, is used many times in Mark to refer to brother handing over brother to death, to the chief priests, especially when they handed Jesus over to Pilate, and to Pilate when he handed him over to death. In Mark, Judas might have handed Jesus over, but many other people handed him over too. Whereas in John's Gospel, Judas bears the guilt almost single-handedly. In Mark, it spread among a number of people. Judas may have betrayed Jesus, but he wasn't alone in doing so. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, you are betrayed by the kiss of a friend. Be with those who are betrayed and slandered and falsely accused. You knew the experience of having your love thrown back in your face for mere silver. Be with families which are torn apart by mistrust or temptation. To you, Jesus, who, who offered your face to your betrayer, be honour and glory with the Father and the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Holy God, holy and strong, holy and immortal, have mercy upon us. See
Jesus condemned by the Sanhedrin. We adore you, O Christ, and we bless you, because by your holy cross you have redeemed the world. A reading from the Gospel according to Mark. Now the chief priests and the whole council were looking for testimony against Jesus to put him to death, but they found none. For many gave false testimony against him, and their testimony did not agree. Some stood up and gave false testimony against him, saying, We have heard him say, I will destroy the temple that is made with hands, and in three days I will build another not made with hands. But even on this point, their testimony did not agree. Then the high priest stood up before them and asked Jesus, Have you no answer? What is it that they testify against you? But he was silent and did not answer. Again, the high priest asked him, Are you the Messiah, the Son of the Blessed One? Jesus said, I am and you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of the power and coming with the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest tore his clothes and said, Why do we still need witnesses? You have heard his blasphemy. What is your decision? All of them condemned him as deserving death. Jesus condemned by the Sanhedrin. They did not agree. One of the most confusing elements of accounts that record the run up to Jesus' death is the account of the trial. Mark's trial narrative is possibly the most confusing of all. In it, he makes various claims. That Jesus' opponents couldn't find any testimony against him. That they gave false testimony and that their testimony did not agree. He even says that some gave false testimony when they reported that Jesus had said that he would destroy this temple and build it in three days. When in John's Gospel, chapter 2, though admittedly not in Mark's, Jesus appears to say precisely this. Unsurprisingly, there is extensive discussion by scholars about the story, with questions focused around whether the accusations against Jesus were true or false, whether the trial was actually a trial or a hearing, and whether, in any case, the council, also known as the Sanhedrin, had the authority to try Jesus in the first place. Such questions important though they are, risk missing the point. What is going on here is a vivid depiction of confusion and desperation. Those accusing Jesus reacted against him viscerally, but had not worked out what lay behind their reaction. As a result, their accusations were wild inconsistent and contradictory. In contrast, Jesus exudes stillness and considered focus. Knowing who you are and why you do what you do at a time of crisis is vital. Without this, chaos ensues. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, you were the victim of religious bigotry. Be with those who are persecuted by small-minded authority. You faced the condemnation of fearful hearts. Deepen the understanding of those who shut themselves off from the wisdom and experience of others. To you, Jesus, unjustly judged victim, be honour and glory with the Father and the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Holy God, holy and strong, 
holy and immortal, have mercy upon us.
Peter denies Jesus. We adore you, O Christ, and we bless you, because by your holy cross you have redeemed the world. A reading from the Gospel according to Mark. At that moment, the cock crowed for the second time. Then Peter remembered that Jesus had said to him, Before the cock crows twice, you will deny me three times. And he broke down and wept. Peter denies Jesus. You will deny me three times. What's worse than doing something that undermines someone whom you love? Mark's account seems to give us the answer here. Letting someone down when you were warned about it in advance and were absolutely confident that you would never do it. This short verse encapsulates powerfully Peter's horror at doing something he swore he would never do. The Greek for he began to weep is slightly odd here and not at all easy to translate. In fact, scholars do not agree on how to translate the phrase that literally means something like and having lain upon, he began to weep. In a sense, however, the clunky, awkward Greek makes the sentiment even more powerful. Peter was beside himself with horror and grief. The fact that the Greek is uncomfortable and makes you trip communicates this powerfully. Peter had done the unthinkable and now had to live with what he had done. The Gospels, each in their own way, remind us that this catastrophic failure was not the end for Peter. In each Gospel, the resurrection accounts make it clear that Jesus forgave Peter for his denial. Mark's own version of Peter's restoration is the message given by the angel to the women at the tomb. In chapter 16, verse 7, the angel says, But go, tell his disciples and Peter. This could be read as a suggestion that Peter is no longer a disciple, but it's more likely that the explicit naming of Peter is a sign that he was very much included. We know that after the resurrection, Jesus forgave Peter. What we don't know is how long it took Peter to forgive himself. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, as Peter betrayed you, you experienced the double agony of love rejected and friendship denied. Be with those who know no friends and are rejected by society. You understood the fear within Peter. Help us to understand the anxieties of those who fear for their future. To you, Jesus, who gazed with sadness at your lost friend, be honour and glory with the Father and the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Holy God, holy and strong, holy and immortal, have mercy upon us.
as we come towards the end of our service. Uh, let us pray for the coming of God's kingdom in the words that our Saviour taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Most merciful Father, who by the death and resurrection of your Son, Jesus Christ, delivered and saved the world, grant that by faith in him who suffered upon the cross, we may triumph in the power of his victory. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Thank you for joining us and praying this Watch of Prayer on Maundy Thursday. We very much hope that you'll join us tomorrow uh, for our Good Friday service, some beautiful music and meditations. And then on Easter Day, on Easter Sunday, uh, we'll have a special service uh, followed by the opportunity to gather together online uh, for a champagne reception or tea and coffee. It's you that provides the drinks, so it's up to you what you bring. But we'll gather together meeting online with the technology of Zoom and there'll be details of how to do that on our website and on the email that we send out with the link. Our final prayer. You are worthy, O Lamb, for you were slain and by your blood you have ransomed for God saints from every tribe and language and nation. You have made them to be a kingdom and priests serving our God. We adore you, O Christ, and we bless you, because by your holy cross you have redeemed the world. The Lord be with you, and also with you. A blessing. May God bless us, that in us may be found love and humility, obedience and thanksgiving, discipline gentleness and peace. Amen.